All right, so this is going to be kind of in a, like a 10, like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, like 10 different things on really kind of how to get value out of email via automation. I really want you to understand like value out of email does not mean some type of quantitative ROI, ROMI. I want us to look at larger types of value because this is one of the rare times in the history of marketing where larger types of value are possible. So a lot of times people are expecting, I want to see a, a return on ROI. I want to see a 5% increase in this. If you're looking at something that has a percentage increase right now in your marketing, you are missing the boat, right? Right now is the, the rare time in the history of our profession where you should be seeing multiples, 16x, 4x, right? So we're going to talk about how do we get those types of increases via mobile and what is the real value of email in the modern marketing workplace. Does that make sense? It's a little different than maybe what you expected, but I think you'll get it. So first thing I want you to understand is this statistic right here. It's a slide. It tells you that mobile search overtook desktop search in 2015. This is very important. What does this mean for the value of email? Well, it means something very simple, right? 66% of all, or 68%, this comes from marketing, uh, search, search marketing land, are opened on a mobile device, right? So if we understand that email is primarily open on a mobile device, you should understand that email is a mobile strategy. So if you are trying to craft a mobile strategy and don't account for email as a part of that mobile strategy, we're very much missing what you should be doing. Email is not just a way to send somebody an email. It's a very contextual, direct piece of communication that can be timely and highly relevant. And we'll talk about that in just a second. So that's the first value, is email is a mobile strategy. Tip number two, right? Email is hyper-targeted. So it's not just, we've all, everyone in this room, by the basis of you raising your hands, you've all moved past the idea of batch and blast, right? You've probably all at least accepted the idea of lead nurturing. Whether or not you've, you've implemented that is a different story, but you've at least accepted that. Would that be true? Would everyone here raise their hand and say they've heard of lead nurturing and understand the value of the concept of lead nurturing? Is that, if, if you've never heard of it, raise your hand and, and feel it's okay to raise your hand. Um, all right, cameraman raised his hand. Okay, here we go. I want to do a quick, uh, this is part of the research that I do, and I want you to kind of understand this as an underlying philosophy of email marketing moving forward and kind of how you market moving forward. So let me ask you a question. Do you do A or B? When you go online, and first, let me, let me take two steps back. So part of what I do is behavioral research. I look at the intersection of technology, media, and relationships. So how does media affect relationships between businesses and consumers? How does media and technology change the buying patterns, the buying behaviors, and the decision-making models of individuals? I believe that if we can understand those things, then we can make marketing best practices that are actually made for this era and this time. Right? So here's, what, here's a way I want to prove this to you, that, that now we do things very different than we've ever done things before. And if we just do a little bit of digging into behavior, we can understand and make very powerful marketing programs, and email is a great use case. So do you do A or B? Do you go online and do you download a piece, or do you download a piece of content like a white paper, log offline, read that white paper, go back online, find another white paper, download it, log offline and read it, or do you do B, do you go online, download a lot of content at one time, log off, and hope to read it? Do you do A or do you do B? B. All right, so that says we have a very specific process, which is called batch research. So you go online, you download a lot of things at one time. This is very key for you to understand, especially if you were doing content marketing, understanding that people, when they download a piece of content, are in the mindset of downloading multiple pieces of content. This is called heuristics. This is a natural behavior because Google has trained you to do this. Here's another fascinating thing. How many pages do you think the average person will go to on your website? Right? Per session, what is the average number of page views? Who wants to take a guess? How about this? Let's just say your website. What's the average number of page views a person has per session on your website? Three, four and a half? The average is 1.7. Right? Why is that number so low? Well, it's because Google has trained you to go back to Google. If you go to a website and you don't instantly find the value you want, let me ask you a simple question. What's more powerful, Google or your own personal website? Google, right? So the natural heuristics of a human is just to go back to Google. So if I go to your website and I don't specifically find exactly what I want that moment, I'm going to go back to Google because I know it's more powerful than your website to answer my question, right? So now let's look at this in terms of content. If I go to your website and I can't find that content or I do find that content, I'm in the process of wanting to find more, so you should give me more, right? So if you graph this out, here's what it looks like. I'm going to get to how this all works in the email very quickly, right? So if you graph how people engage with content on a daily basis, you'll see two lines. One is this white line. It's that dotted line. That's your average daily content consumption, 
which means you're going to consume about the same amount of content every day, right? My father reads the same newspaper, does the same crossword, spends about the same amount of time, then goes to work about the exact same amount of time. You have those same daily processes, they're just split up. You're going to spend about an average of a couple hours on Facebook. You're going to spend an average of 12.28 hours in front of a screen every day, right? These are average things. Let's talk about when you have a question, how does that change that average consumption model? When you have a question, we just said you go online and download a lot of content. So your average daily consumption is going to spike at that point in time. You're then going to run that up to what I call a threshold where you feel that you have enough information to make your decision or answer your question, and then you stop. So you see a spike, and then you stop. Does it make sense so far? All right, the next question you should be asking me is, well, why are there three spikes on that chart? So I did a research project. So I gather 400 B2B buyers, and I say, I want to understand how you engage with content. I said, if you're going to buy something that costs over $1,000, how many times do you go back to Google and ask different questions before you are ready to talk to a salesperson? So by the way, this is just within marketing's control. This is not accounting for the sales cycle. Right? And they said on an average of two to three times. Right? So if we can assume that a person is going to go back two to three times to ask two to three different questions in a buying cycle, those questions also I asked, are those questions different? They said they're very different, and they want different content when they ask each one of those different questions as to you, right? So let me, let me wrap this to you in a, in, a, in a little story. We all like stories. It's called The Girl at the Party. This actually happened to me. So I'm at a wedding, and it's a friend of mine, and so I'm there. I'm at the singles table, and I'm sitting next to a person, and so you have to have that awkward conversation. And for me, most awkward conversations start the same way. I say, what do you do? Right? It's kind of a nice way to like, figure out, you know, what's this person about? What are they into? I think we all probably do something very similar. So I asked this person next to me, I said, what do you do? And she goes, I do marketing. I was like, great, I know a little bit about marketing. We can chat, right? So I got really excited. And I said, you do email marketing? And she goes, yeah, I do email marketing. She starts to tell me a little bit about her business. She's an individual marketer at a small golf store. And then I, say, I ask her what tool she uses. And she says, I use Exact Target and I hate it. And I was like, well, that's awkward because I work for Exact Target. <laughs> so, uh, so how can I help, right? And she goes, well, it doesn't do good enough segmentation. And at this point in time, um, two things. One, I had just written marketing automation for dummies. And the other is Microsoft had just used the exact target platform to launch Microsoft 365, which if you're a Windows user is like the new modern, uh, what everybody uses from Microsoft, right? They were doing real-time segmentation by an actual supercomputer, not air quote super, supercomputer, like a legit supercomputer of the world. And so they're doing segmentation with the supercomputer in real time on millions of bytes of data. She is it saying hurts the same tool doesn't do good enough segmentation. So there, there's, a, there's a clear disconnect. So I ask, what do you mean by segmentation, right? A very fair question. And her response was, well, anytime somebody opts out of an email, I want to remove them from one list and add them to another list. I said, well, that's your problem. That's not called segmentation. That's an automation. You need a marketing automation tool. Her response was, no, 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 no. My response to that was, well, what else do you do? Right? It's like, let's, let's keep this conversation moving forward. She just had no clue. So now, what if we do this? If we go back to those three spikes, and we understand, we know her problem. She has a problem. We know exactly how to solve that problem. I work for a company that can solve that problem. What if I send her an email that says, Pardot's the best marketing automation platform? Does she open that email, yes or no? No, exactly right. She doesn't. Right, so if we understand that email can be hyper-targeted to the exact point in time, if we could figure out exactly what question she was asking, we can then dynamically change the email communication to be triggered at the time to answer that exact question. Right? And it's called stage-based marketing. It's understanding what stage this person is in. This is where you start using marketing automation tools to combine behavioral activities to say, if she's looking for segmentation, she's coming to our website, downloading content on segmentation, we should assume that we have to talk with her about segmentation. This seems very generic and basic. But the point I'm trying to make is, if you understand that, you then have to understand that there's other questions that she has to ask. So the goal that we should be using by email is to answer her questions now, as well as to lead her to the next question she has to ask. Because we cannot send her an email that says, buy Pardot, or buy whatever tool technology you're selling. They have to figure that out on their own. Email can only help answer questions and propose new questions to be asked. That should be the point and the value of email. Does that make sense in kind of this scenario? All right, cool. So stage-based marketing. Let me break this down to you in subject line matter. Right, so subject lines are very important. Now let me ask you another question. Right, so let's say that you walk into your office or you pick up your phone, you roll over in bed, and the first thing you do is open your email. I don't care how you get to your email inbox in the morning. Let me ask you how you use your email inbox. So do you A... Or do you B? Do you A, 
open the first email that you see, start to scan it, decide if it's good content, want to continue reading it or delete it, move to the next one, open it, start to scan it, and continue all the way through your email inbox, or do you do B? Do you open your email inbox, scan it, delete all the crap, and then work on the rest? B, we all do B. Now, who taught you how to do that? The answer is nobody. Once again, this is why I studied the behaviors of modern time and how media affects these buying decisions. Right? So now the question I want uh, to really hone in on is how many bits of information are you making that decision on? There's about 150 characters. Right? There's a subject line, which is based on your, your screen. It's going to be about 100 to 150 characters long. And there's the sender. That's the only two pieces of information you have to determine on if this is a legitimate email or not and you just answer that you are so effective you can do it in a fraction of a second, right? Think about that. How can you determine if an email is coming from a marketer that quick or if it's coming from somebody that you actually need to engage with, right? So you're reading that subject line. Now let's look at this. The first way to get value out of the email is the email has to get opened, right? So we have to have subject lines that people open. If you go back to that stage-based marketing logic, we need to have subject lines that match those stages. In stage one, my assumption is that somebody does not understand the questions they're asking, right? This is when people are just kind of asking generic questions. They're trying to figure things out. Back to that scenario, she's asking about segmentation. She wants to be a better email marketer. She doesn't know the word marketing automation. She doesn't know the vendors in the space, right? So if I send her anything that says vendors in the space, my brand, or the keyword, it's going to instantly trigger that in her head that this is an email from a marketer. Does that make sense? So I follow the logic of no, no, which means no keywords and no brand in stage one subject lines. And you might say, well, then what's left? What can I write about? Well, think about who's the best email marketer in your organization. I hate to tell you it is not an email marketer. Look at anybody that has a personal email outbox from Gmail, from Outlook. Those are the most engaged with emails on a percentage basis that come from your organization. Right? They're going to have the highest open rate and the highest engagement rate of any emails your organization sends. But why is that? It's because they're written like humans. Why do we not like salespeople? Because they talk with the golden tongue. Well, if we're writing emails trying to convert people to open our emails and buy something, are we not writing with the golden pen? Is it not just the converse? Right? So you can't write like that. You have to write like humans because we have been attuned to identify a human-based subject line from a marketing-based subject line, and you already proved that. Does that make sense? You guys follow along? All right, cool. Stage two subject lines, this is where people are trying to get social proof. So they might have bought into the idea, they may know the marketplace, they may know something, but don't overload them, use one or the other, use either your brand or your keyword, but not both, that's a little too much. Um, and then try to help them with social proof, give them ammunition to make a decision, right? Remember, in a B2B scenario, there are seven people on average making a decision. A lot of the times, your person is probably gonna know that they want this and wants to do it, we would call that the champion, but they now have to convince others. Give them that ammunition to convince others in this stage. The third, is when they're then gonna start selecting vendors. So this is when it is okay to use both, your keyword or your brand. Because the problem that they're facing now is they don't wanna make a decision without all of the information. Does that make sense? There's that fear that you're addressing. That fear of, I don't wanna choose something without knowing all my options. And that's all you're addressing and it's a very short period in time.